Well, hello and welcome to another Dev Nation Tech Talk. We actually have another excellent presentation to give you today. And I just was a few minutes late because I had a cable modem challenge. You guys know what I'm talking about here. When the internet won't connect, what can you do? So in this case, we're gonna be talking now to Alex Soto. Alex Soto is part of our developer experience team. He is the fellow coming out of Spain right now, traveling all over Europe and all across the globe, talking to developers about how to build better software. And today he's gonna to talk to us about how to do testing, specifically leveraging something very cool in a Kubernetes OpenShift standpoint, you guys are going to see it here presented today and talk about end-to-end -end testing and testing in production. So Alex, at this point, let me not take up any more time, but take it away. Thank you. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, thanks, Bert, for this introduction. Today, we're going to uh, talk about testing in production. So thank you very much for joining to this the Nation session. And we're going to just see, you know, an introduction of testing in production because, you know, it's a really big, big topic. But um, you'll see, j just say, the basics. You will learn the basics of testing in production. And also, I will give you some hints so you can start implementing it after this talk. My name is Alex Soto. I work in Red Hat. I'm the co-author of Testing Java Microservices book. And I was also, I'm the author of several uh, articles in magazines also, and also cheat sheets. One of the things that I, I want to tell you before I start is that probably some of you will say, these things that you're explaining to me is a stupid or it has no sense, or my manager will never allow me to do this, or even I, I think that it's not the right way of testing applications. And that's right. It's, it's normal that you think this, but if you start doing tests for microservices architecture. And when I say microservices architecture, I'm not saying um, 10 or 15 services. I'm thinking about 100, 120 services. Then it's the right time to um, rewatch this presentation. So this presentation is about testing and DevOps. And one of the great resources out there is in this, in the, in the Puppet uh, side, well, they uh, every year publishes this white paper about the state of DevOps, right? And they uh, and one really interesting quote about DevOps is that high performer organizations are decisively outperforming their lower performing peers. So if you adopt DevOps, you're going to be able to outperform your competitors. But let's see some numbers. Um, for example, you're you're uh, going to be able to do 46 more deployments than your competitors. And this, if you think about it um, deeply, means that you're going to be able to hit the market 46 more times than them. Also, you're going to um, have shorter lead times. In fact, 440 um, uh, shorter lead times rather than your competitors. Um, lead time is the time that is measured from you have an idea and this idea it's available for your client, for your customer. So it's the process of thinking about it, designing, developing, testing, and finally deploying and releasing to your public. So if you have this time shorter, it means that you are going to be able to release these ideas faster than your competitors. And of course, errors happen because it's natural. And if you embrace DevOps, then your, uh, your time to recover is going to be 96 times faster. So this is fundamentally what is happening today in most of the companies is that developers are not responsible of what's happening after the check-in. So uh, the life cycle for a developer is that they just go to the issue tracker, they get it some issue, they, you know, they create a branch with Git, they fix the problem, they write the test, they try it locally, and then they push the code. After that, they wait until the CI system, for example, Jenkins, um, says that everything is green, so that the, all the tests has pass, uh, passes, that everything is fine, and then someone will review the change and squash and merge into the master branch, right? And that's all. They do not care about how this piece of software is going to be deployed to production. Because at the end, this is something that, you know, operation guide will do some 
time, probably at 5 p.m. So we need to break this wall of confusion. We need to work together hand by hand, depths and ups. And this means that if operations uh, team stay all the weekend trying to deploy a, a new service to production, developers should be there as well. And of course, this means that there is a change. Basically, the change of the definition that we have of done. Usually, from the developer point of view, done it's something it's done when you close the issue on the issue tracker. So, for example, when uh, I've tested and I know that it's, that works, and this change is merged to master, then as a developer point of view, this is done. The problem is that this is not true if you want to do DevOps. Something is done when it's deployed and released to production. Because we need to think about something really important. Your code has no business value until it's deployed. So you can discuss about you know, frameworks to use. If you are willing to do this with Quarkus of, or Spring Boot or Vertex or any technology, or we can discuss about patterns. If you need to use this pattern or this other pattern, or even we can discuss about clean code, if, this, if we should do our code more cleaner. But we can discuss more and more and more and more. But you need to always keep in mind that until the, the software is deployed, it's not deployed, we are not giving value to our business. But of course, it's not about that and ops. It's the whole organization that need to have, you know, embrace DevOps and, and have a common ground re regarding DevOps. It's about ops, it's about the PBO, the, the, the security team, the DBAs, the QA. Everyone should be involved from the beginning of the project in the task. So this means that testing is not an end part of the cycle. Usually, um, if you think about how you're working, it's like that you develop and then you move the sticker from the board from developing to testing, and then someone tests this, and then this sticker is moved to operations, and these operations deploy the, the, the new service, right? This is not how it should be. Things should be done from the beginning. The testing team should be hand by hand with the developer checking how the service is going to be tested. So uh, this is really important that DevOps means not Dev and Ops, but all the organization. But of course, I mean, after that, you're going to start using all this continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, continuous operation, all these um, automatic things, right? To be able to reach production um, faster, because you know, if you automate everything, then everything goes pretty fast. The problem is that your uh, you you can apply all these techniques, but uh, still your time to reach production is too high. And the thing is that why it's happening this, and the problem usually it's in the QA. Organization organization sees testing as an expensive task that slows everything. When you check why a project is never on time, you always end up by identifying that okay the QA department is spending a lot of time testing the application. And why is happening this? Well, basically it's happening because the organization requires to verify this new service, this new service manually. And uh, once we need to validate manually is the QA department. So of course, verifying something manually takes a lot of time. But it's not only this. If you have a process where the QA is doing some kind of manual testing, developers involuntarily will think that uh, someone is going to test my work after me. So I don't need to you know, write extensive tests maybe because you know, there will be someone that manual will check. So um, QA department is going to be in charge of verifying the software. It's going to be in charge of catching technological bugs, but not only this, probably they will catch some bugs. They will go to the dev and say, hey, look, this is failing. Dev is going to fix this problem. And then the QA, uh, the QA guy will be responsible of checking that it has been fixed correctly. So now QA team is doing two things, verifying software, catching 
issues and verifying that the issues has been fixed correctly. But recently, because of infrastructure as code, everything is really easy to replicate. Every environment is replicable really um, fast. You can have production and you have QA just you know, running the same um, a script. The problem is that since it's really easy, companies start um, populating all these environments across the organization. So you have the production environment and then you have the QA environment. The problem with the QA environment is that it, this is where you're going to run your manual test, but you need to maintain this environment. You need to update it when production environment is updated. You need to check when it fails what's going on and how to fix it. Or even you need to maintain the data sets that are inside the database. And usually all these tasks, since it's a QA environment, falls into the QA team. So as you can see, the QA team now is even doing another thing, which is maintaining the QA environment, so another task. Even if you think about not in the QA team, but in the, in the uh, point of view of organization, having a QA um, environment, it's really expensive to run and maintain because at the end, you still need machines or let's call it cloud machines running this QA environment. So it's expensive to run and expensive to maintain because the QA um, department is in charge on doing it. But in any case, I've been in several companies which you know we heavily rely on QA environments and manual testing. So we did all this process. It took some time to reach production, but at the end we arrived to production. So you know developers write unit tests, component tests, contract tests. Um, QA departments do a lot of manual testing. We deploy to staging, everything works. So we go to production and everybody is really happy until, well, we break production. And we can break production because production always has uh, some units. For example, the network setup, I mean, the DNS, the firewalls, the database schemas probably are 99% the same, but it can be some changes. Or even, for example, the actual weight of data it's really bigger than in comparison of um, the QA environment. So this is where we can think about that. How about removing QA environment? I don't want QA environment. I don't want pre-production environment. I don't want to run end-to-end -end tests manually. The only thing that I want is production environment. Of course, just having production environment requires a change on mindset, an appetite for risk, and also changing the way we um, develop our services. Because now, when we develop a service, we are always thinking that this service is going to work, right? But now what we need to do is start developing, thinking that all service is going to fail. So instead of developing for success, we need to uh, develop for failure. Of course, when we are talking about testing in production, we are relying on, an, on another concept, which is really important. In the past, we can say that deploy and release was more or less the same. When we say that we are going to deploy to production, we were just thinking that we are going to take the service, put it on the production cluster, and um, our clients are, are going to start reaching in. And when we say we are releasing our services, it's exactly, exactly the same. But in microservices, the deploy and release is a really, really different steps. One thing is deploy, which means taking our service and putting inside the production cluster. Another thing is doing the release phase. The release phase is changing something in the infrastructure to start sending public traffic into this service. So now we have deploy and we have release and it's totally different. So probably the testing parameter has changed it a bit. Now we don't have this unit test, component test and end-to-end -end test, but we have something like that. 
We have the blue column, which is a pre-production column, where is all the tests that are written by usually developers, and they are run in Jenkins for every pull request. So it's unit test, component test, contract test, acceptance test, smoke test, and so on. But then there is three columns, which is the testing in production columns, where it's divided into three stages. The first one is deploy. So it's when we deploy our service to production, which test I need to run? OK, you need to run integration tests. This is something that maybe it shocks you, because why you should run integration tests in, in, uh, against production environment? And uh, the answer is that you need to do it, because if not, they don't have any sense to do it. Because why you want to uh, run integration tests against an artificial environment? It's totally pointless. Then we have tab compare, load test, showing uh, test, and config test. Then after deploy, we said that we release our service. In the release phase, we need to use uh, some of these testing techniques, canary, dark canaries, monitoring, future flying, exception tracking, or future graduation. But then with microservices and testing in production, there is another phase, and it's the post release. Usually, when we release our um, services, we said, OK, we've been, it has been released. That's, uh, that's OK. We are not going to test it anymore. With testing in, in production, you still need to test in this phase, using tail profiling, logs, cause testing, monitoring, A-B testing, tracing, and so on. So as you can see, then now the, the testing is across all the life cycle of the software. Of course, you don't need to start at once applying all these testing techniques. You can start with three or four with the, the simple ones and a step by step and uh, increasing your, um, your um, confidentially with this. Of course, none of these things explained here are easy and often requires a fundamental change in the way systems are designed, developed, tested, deployed, and released. So of course, it's a big, big change to um, embrace testing in production. Let's see some of these techniques that I've, I showed you pre uh, previously. And this, uh, in this case, is uh, a technique tab compare, which happens in the deploy phase. So when we deploy our service to production, but no public traffic is sent. And in this case, uh, um, tab compares, it's used for uh, detecting regressions. For example, we have service A version one, we have service A version two, and we want to detect if it has been introduced any regression. And the regression can be a performance regression, it can be a back regression, it can be an output regression. Maybe the, the output from uh, both services has changed. So tab compare is a kind of test that allows you to detect these regressions before going public. There are two tools for doing that. One is differential, another one is uh, Open Diffy. The good thing about differential is that it's implemented in Go, but it's integrated with Java. So it's really fast. Um, it's Kubernetes friendly, so you can run differential support, and it integrates fairly well with Prometheus. And this means that all these regressions can be monitored by your monitoring system, in this case, Prometheus. But of course, it also supports other systems. And just in, in, in for the schema, it was it, what, how it works is that differentia is a proxy where, where you are sending a request, and then this request is sent to service AB1 and service AB2. Then both services return a response, and then you compare, and then you send the status to the monitoring system, and you send the result. OK, another test are the uh, release part. In this release part, there are a lot of tests. One of those are blue-green deployment. Blue green deployments are based on that you have two identical environments and you are just switching from one environment to another environment. In, for example, in the blue environment, you set the service A version one, and in the green environment, you set um, uh, service A version two. And it works something like this where you have all your traffic going to the service uh, AB1, and then you deploy into the production service. And then finally, you reroute all the traffic to the um, service V2. And after that time, you need to you know, monitor for any uh, failure, which you, know, um, it, you can detect any problem. 
if you detect a problem, then you can really quick switch from V2 to V1. So it's really fast to recover from a failure. Of course, this technique is really great, but it has some problems. And is that it's a um, all or none problem. So uh, all or nothing, right? So it's or all the users work or all the users will receive the failure. To avoid this problem, there is another technique which is called canary release. And canary release is similar to a blue green, but it behaves uh, differently in the sense that you deploy the new service, okay? And then you start sending public traffic too. But instead of sending all the public traffic, you start sending just 1% of the traffic or 5% of the traffic. If you monitor and you see that everything works as expected, you can move forward to the 10%, 25%, 50%, 100%. So instead of um, doing an all or nothing approach where all the users could fail, now you are just you know, selecting and a small portion of your traffic to check if the new service works or not. Of course, this works in most of the cases, but if you have a heavy low traffic, and I'm thinking, for example, like Facebook that had thousands of requests per second, then one person of the users are a lot of users. For this reason, um, companies like Google, Amazon, or Facebook created uh, one set of techniques to test on production without the end user noticing it, and which is called dark launches. And dark, you can think about dark launches like an umbrella of ways to test or uh, services on production. I'm going to show you two different um, approaches. The first one is dark canaries, which basically are based on the next thing is that you have version one where all the public traffic goes there. And then uh, you have a subset of well known users. Maybe it's internal users, maybe our client that you have a special agreement with them. So they receive this update before the rest of the public users. So these internal users, which could be the QA department or some clients that you have a confidence with them, they are going to start receiving um, these updates sooner than the, the rest, and they will help you to test them. Another, another um, technique is shadowing traffic. Shadowing traffic is based on mirroring the traffic to both services at the same time. But notice that. In version B1, you are sending a response. The service B1 is, is the, the blue ring, the blue. Uh, you are sending a request and then you're receiving your response. In case of green, which is the V2, you're just sending a request and that's all. So this is what is called a fire and forget request. So you're sending a request and you don't care about your response. But the, the good thing about this uh, um, approach is that you are monitoring this new version to detect if there is some kind of failures or not. So you are anticipating any problem that might occur when you, for example, start sending the public traffic. Another technique is future graduation, which basically uh, uh, lets uh, the user to choose which level of, of confidence have with the system. This is from OpenShift IO, currently it's called CoreReady, which is from Red Hat, where you have a, a tab which is called Futures Optim, where you can choose the level of confidence with the system. So depending on the level that you choose here, better future experimental or internal experimental, you're going to be redirected to a more mature um, service. Another testing technique, this is for the post release, is um, cause engineering. Um, cause engineering, it's basically what you are doing is inject failures in your system on purpose to see how it behaves under these circumstances. Maybe you are wondering why I should do this. And basically is that because you don't choose the moment when the failure happens. The moment chooses you. You only choose how prepared you are when it does. So it's really important to see what's happening when there are problems before they happen. So you know that how the system will react when they really happen. But I, I like to uh, see that, please be aware of this. Because if you are um, too confident on, on cause engineering or in your system, and you start doing every, you know, um, cause engineering destroying your system, probably you're going to destroy it for real. 
and then all your clients are not going to be able to reach your 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 system right your cluster because you have just killed all so start with a small uh, experiments check with a small failures and step by step just increase the kind this kind of experiments so let's see in a demo some of these concepts basically blue green deployments canary releases and um, um mirroring traffic or shadowing traffic and in this case i'm going to use kubernetes and istio and uh, istio is a service mesh and a service mesh is a dedicated infrastructure layer that allows you to modify the network or the communication between services so for example you can redirect traffic to one service on another service in purpose or you can encrypt traffic between services or for example you can um add some resiliency for example automatic retries in the communications so let's see it in this case i've recorded because sometimes i have some a performance problem when i'm sharing my screen so i recorded the demos uh, and this, uh, I will share you the link so you can test it for you. In this case, uh, you can see that I have a customer, a preference services, and a recommendation. And then I have version B1 and version B2. So I have like four microservices there. So now, um, what's happening when I, you know, I just call, all right, get access to the customer. In this case, I'm just getting it. And you can see that I'm just getting the customer preference recommendation B1. And then I'm getting customer preference recommendation V2 in the second curve. This is because by default, Istio uh, follows a round robin approach, which you know you send request to V1 and then request to V2. Which is, you know, that, that, that's fine. But then what I, I'm going to do now is just send all traffic to V1. So I just create an Istio resource, which is a virtual service, and I said, okay, now what I want to do is just send all traffic to v1 and now for every curl that i do it always go to version v1 now uh, let me what's happened when i do kubectl replace and i add the version v2 so i want to send all traffic to v2 notice that this is a blue green i'm changing from blue to green of course i just apply this it's still resource and then everything goes to v2 if you are you know, interested in knowing um, there is an error and you want to get, go back to B1, I can just replace again to B1 and then everything is replaced. And as you will see, all the code goes again to B1. So it's really fast, really easy. And if you want to see how this uh, file looks like, you can see here that I'm just saying that the recommendation service has a version B1 and I want to send all the traffic let's go quick to canary if you want to do a canary it's really easy because the only thing that you need to do is again create a new or apply a new uh is your source in this case i'm sending 75 percent of traffic to v1 and 25 to um v2 notice that now i'm doing the call and you you get it the ones the ones and then um some v2s and so on it's like 75 25. This is a canary release, as we explained. And you want to see how this works. It just, you know, you define the recommendation. And I said that the uh, recommendation service sends the, uh, for version V1, I want to send the 75% of the traffic, but for the 72, I want to send the 25% of the traffic. And the last one is that dark or the shallowing traffic. In this sense, it's a bit more complicated to show, but notice that. Uh, when I'm doing a call, in this case, I'm, I'm not applying showing traffic yet. You see, this, this is, there is a number. This is a counter that is incremented for every request that I send. Notice that the V2 is in the number 13 and the V1 is in number 23. Then I can apply another uh, resource, okay, which is the uh, recommendation V1 mirror V2. And if you check here, and this is the log of the service you can see here that it is sorry uh, i'm just checking the recommendation one b2 i'm i'm going inside recommendation and notice that here the last lock is the 13. okay now i can go 
uh, to the again here i can do the the call and notice that i do call and call and all the time i'm receiving the v1 and the v1 with the 24 and the 25 the counter is incremented and remember that the last counter it's a 13 of the v2 but now if i check the logs of v2 you see that there is a 14 and 15. So you can see that this mirroring traffic, it's working. And it's working because the request is received into V2. But it's never get back to the client. The client will always receive the V1. So you can see here the uh, request of request and forget approach. So we are almost done. If you want to uh, learn more about this, this is, there are some links here. So maybe you are wondering how I can start doing testing in production. The first thing that you need to do is having QAs and devs working together from the beginning. I know that there are some kind of complicated relationship between devs and um, testers, but this is something that you need to fix and work always together and a start with a really, really simple service, preferably uh, and a stateless service. Of course, devs can still think that, okay, I don't need to write tests because you know there is this um, mirroring traffic thing or this tab compare thing that is going to catch my bugs. So I'm, I'm going to not spend time on writing unit tests or component tests because you know there is another automatic um, algorithm that is going to detect them. No, this is wrong. You still need to write unit tests, component tests, acceptance tests, and so on, because you need to have confidence on your uh, sir, on your software. And when you have the confidence that everything is going to work as expected, then I start doing testing in production. Of course, the final idea of testing in production is that the manual, uh, the manual testing, it's going to be done by your clients or by your customers, but not by your QA department. Your QA department has other duties to do, but not testing manually. For this uh, duty, for this um, task, you need to relay on your customers and your clients. And that's all. If you have any questions or anything, you can um, ping me on Twitter or by mail or in my website or on my YouTube channel. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that, Alex. And we are out of time. If you could, though, if you have those links handy, drop them into the chat real fast because folks would be interested in those links. Yeah. And, and that way they have access to them here. And of course, you can follow Alex on Twitter. With, the, with his Twitter, you'll see that he'll publish these links and other slides and other demos and other content uh, as available. And you should actually take those videos and put them up on YouTube and also publish them from that perspective as well. Yeah, All I will. Right. I mean, I will put the videos. I will put the videos. I will put the link. Everything in Twitter. I will publish, and, and even the slides. I will publish right now. I mean, that in in five minutes. Yeah, yeah. So just follow him on Twitter, and then you better check that out. I thank you all for your time today, and I apologize for our slow start because we did have a problem, a technical problem that I had to work my way through. But make sure you follow Alex on Twitter, and I'll just add that link here. All right. So there's the Twitter link, which is the most important link. And that's all we have time for. I apologize, but we have to get going. Thank you so much. Thank you.